Shrey, I am so happy that you are here. Um, anybody who follows me knows I root for the Hawks. So I am a big Trey fan, a big Hawks fan. So happy you took the time to do this. First off, how are you feeling? We'll start there. Uh, I've been better for sure. Uh, this is my first time uh, having like a, an injury like this where it's held me out for, for weeks. Um, I didn't know. I, this is like my first time missing more than four games in a row. So it's like it's definitely – um, new to me, but I've been better. I'm going to be all right, though. I'll be back soon. So you just mentioned it. I mean, first surgery of your career. I'm sure it was a lot of emotions around that. Mm -hmm. What were you feeling when you went into the hospital, and how were you feeling when you left? Oh, I was I was nervous as hell going into the, the hospital. Uh, just like you said, it was my first surgery. Um, my dad said I had something when I broke my leg when I was like three, but I don't, obviously don't remember that. But <laughs> so this is like knowing the surgery is about to happen. There's just a lot of anxiety going into it, but it was, uh, it was easy. I had a, a really good doctor uh, that did it out here in New York. So um, got me right, but it was quick and easy, but definitely nervous going into it. And you have only missed 36 of 440 games that you have played with the Hawks. That is a very small number. This is something that you are not used to. So when you're on the sidelines, what is that experience for you mentally, like not being able to be out there? Um, it's different. Like you have to, you have to always be engaged, obviously. But it's it's new for me. So I'm like. I'm trying to be engaged. I'm trying not to move my hand as much because I have to be still in certain places. But I'm, I'm competitive and I'm with my teammates and I want them to win. So just being in there these last couple of games just, is, just makes me realize just how much I really miss it and enjoy the, the game of basketball because it's just a different feel to be on the sidelines and obviously being in the game. But the competitive side is always there. Yeah. Are you a person that, like, struggles with impatience or do you trust the process of, like, yeah. I got to get better. I got to nah. get out. Okay. <laughs> no, nah, no. Nah. I'm, I'm impatient in a lot of ways, but I, I do I do trust the process in, in a lot. But I put I work so hard, and I feel like the work that I put in um, it should show. It should show for something. So, obviously, you want to put in the work. You know things uh, that are great usually happen over time, and it takes a process. But... I'm I'm definitely impatient in a lot of ways because I want I want success. You want you want to win. You want things to to show for what you work for. So definitely impatient in a lot of ways. But um, I'm more impatient than than more just trusting this process. Yeah, and I'm <laughs> sure in your life the impatience has helped you in a lot of arenas too. Sure. Like the want to get out there, the want to be better, and things like that. So I I totally get the two sides of that coin. Well, before you got hurt, let's talk about that. Um, because something that has been really cool to see are your improvements on defense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I spoke to you, it might have been your rookie year, and I said, can you be an elite defender at your size? You said yes, but you said, you know, I'm never going to be like a Pat Bev type of defender, but I could be a pest. I could be like Chris Paul. I could keep my guy out the paint. I could get those sneaky steals, and you're inching closer and closer to that type of defender. Mm -hmm. How proud are you just looking at your <laughs> defensive accomplishments? Because that was certainly a thing. Yeah. No, it definitely was. I mean, I'm, I'm proud of myself, but I mean, like you said, like trusting the process, I think being a, a really great defender, even a really good defender in the league, it, it takes time. You have to you have to learn certain techniques, especially being the size I am, um, playing in a tall man's game, like you have to be smart in a lot of ways. You have to be you have to go through certain things to learn certain things to to be better on that end. So I feel like now I've I've got more years, I've been able to learn different places I can be at. I can take little charges here and there. I can be in certain places. I think I just had to learn certain things, and I feel like now it's showing a little bit more this year, obviously, and yeah. uh, it helped me. I've, I mean, obviously, I've had a little. Not a lot of people know this, but I had a, I had like a little side side bet with CC before I got hurt. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let everybody know now it's off just because I'm hurt. But <laughs> uh, we had a little a little charge bet because um, he led our team in steals. I mean, in charges last year. So just to like kind of like give me a little motivation and. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to kind of help our team in that way. I made a little bet with them before before the season started. So uh, that was one of the things just kind of helped me yeah. be bet on that end too. I love that. Okay, this might be a bit of a loaded question and a hard question, but it's more that I just would like you to reflect on it. With what you just said, why do you think you weren't a good defender? Um, this, I don't, I don't, 
that's a lot of factors that go into that. I feel like, um, obviously, I'm going to point towards myself. I feel like def- defensive, defensively, it, it's all about effort and um, giving more effort. And I think sometimes earlier in my career, I felt like I needed to be out there for my team. And I may not have given as much effort as I probably should have. Um, on that other end, just to, to be out there on the on the floor for my team. And uh, some people could look at it backwards, and I, I, I could have been better in, at that too. And uh, But I feel like I did still give effort at times. And But when you don't win, obviously it shows. And But it's not an individual sport neither too, so I can't guard five people. And I, nobody would want me to guard all five people because that wouldn't work <laughs> anyways. But I'm just saying I feel like there's times that you can get better, and uh, I feel like I've gotten better since then. No, you absolutely have gotten better. You are playing winning defense at yeah. times. Listen, <laughs> I see you closing out those games. It is important, <laughs> I think, to really think about the growth and the steps that you've taken, and I love that right there you said so much of it is effort because that is what a lot of defense is. Mm-hmm. And I think that in the league sometimes when you're here and, of course, it's your job, it's hard to have the same level of effort all the time. Mm-hmm. But I think think that the more you're in the league the more you understand that that is what makes you really great at it yeah I mean people don't and I come in as a rookie you don't it's hard to totally to understand the, the back-to-backs the long season and mm-hmm. like you said I've only missed what 30 some games out of 400 like I, I didn't miss many games so yeah. it's like I'm actually playing the back-to-backs I'm playing the three out of four nights like so I'm playing as a rookie 19 years old banging against 35 29 year olds like that are fully grown men I'm just learning through these experiences and I feel like that has ultimately got me to here and it's going to make me even better uh, even going forward too. Yeah and it gets lost at like what you're describing is that's life that's every single mm-hmm. person that has ever done anything including playing in the NBA you start not knowing a lot you experience it and you get better as time goes by so mm-hmm. I am happy to see all Appreciate the improvements uh, defensively. Um, as someone who is an elite shooter I want to ask you about this obviously there's a lot of discourse now about all the 50 point games 60 point games 70 point games and people feel like since there is so much less defense now that some of those games don't mean as much. Mm. I would like to hear where you are um, in that in that kind of argument and what you agree with and disagree with. I mean, I think that, I mean, everybody has their, their certain <laughs> their takes on this. I feel like for me, the game is just different. I, it's called different. Players obviously evolve. We learn from the greats before us, and we try to take what they've done and try to remix it and make it, um, even better nowadays so I feel like the game is always going to get better and it's always going to grow so um, I feel like with numbers going up that's just that's just like evolution it's going to it's going to happen especially with the way the defense is nowadays like if you really wanted more defense in basketball put defense at three seconds back in the game where um, certain rule changes would be different like and I feel like that would change the outlook of offense and how how easy it is to score because I mean guys are just so talented we know how to get by our defenders and it's it's, it's so much space in the game in the NBA that of course it's way easier to score than college or overseas like just because there's so much space and so much talent on the floor that you can't really help each other as much because of the defensive rules and so it's a lot of a lot of reasons why that offense is is geared to have more effect on the game today than the defense is but I mean that's just that's the the way the NBA made the rules and that's that's what people have to uh, to go with I mean they want to continue to change it I've been a part of rule changes here recently so uh, (laughs) I don't get shooting fouls no more like Mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of points that I don't get anymore um, but I still find a way to still score so it's it's okay but I feel like just the game is always going to get better. Yeah, and I mean, to be clear, there have, of course, been rule changes that do hurt the offense, like the flopping or the kind of the contact baiting. So Mm -hmm. there are things that do happen there. But would you agree that the way the game is now, it just kind of inherently helps the offense more than it does the defense? Of course, yeah. I I mean, it definitely does. I definitely feel like it does. I feel like if you change the rules, offensive guys are still going to find ways to, to to maneuver around it and, and be better. But, yeah, definitely the rules now, I mean, give the offensive player way more leverage than a defensive player. But, I mean, I don't know if it's always been that way. Um, I don't think the defense has always ever had more leverage than the offensive player. 
uh, I just feel like the offensive players have obviously gotten better too in their skill wise that um, and just from learning from the past greats that that's that's why the offense is so good nowadays too yeah I always like hearing NBA players take on this especially those that are like very offensively talented like yourself because something that comes up a lot is you know the fans want to see offense and of course they do it's mm -hmm. exciting but I wonder if we have started to think that excitement also means quality because mm -hmm. those two things aren't the same. And mm -hmm. in some ways, you could argue this is a bit of an overcorrection that we are not sometimes not seeing defense at all. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. also can't be how it is. No, no, trust me, it can't be. Like, trust me, there's times, like when Luca scored 70 on us, like, I mean, there's, there's times you're like, shit, you, you want to <laughs> you you give more and be more aggressive on him, but like, he's so fucking smart. Like, if you, if you put your hand in there, he's going to reach up and he's so strong he's gonna go through your arm and get a three point play in, instead of two. Like it's it's a lot of a lot of ways that the defender is really, really hurt in a lot of ways to be physical on on a guy and so you really just have to double double guys nowadays. And so when Lucas scored seventy on us is we didn't really double him. Like we just let him play ones and like it's 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 tough. Like the defender is not it's not I mean, there's no really things for him to do, and we have to really help him. And so, yeah, like you said, the offense is definitely geared to have more, more better nights in the defense. Yeah, and especially when there there are just more great scorers than there are great defenders. Yeah, <laughs> which that's is a, just a fact too. Yeah, it just adds to that imbalance. When you look at the All Star Game, of course, there was a lot of discourse about the competition in that game. Do you think the lack of that competition has to do with maybe the lack of defense, or do you think it has more to do with the players? I don't know. I, I don't know. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by like the like, players? Sometimes when you'll hear, you know, the old heads talking about it, they're like, they going out all-star game, they don't care. <laughs> they're friends. The East not trying to represent, yeah. you know, and things like that. Yeah. And there probably is an element of truth to that. But to your point, I also think the all-star game has changed over the years. Yeah. No, I think, it, I think it's changed. I mean, for me, I wish it was a little bit more competitive. Mm -hmm. um, but to be honest, like, it is kind of different, like the way I used to watch the the game. Like back then, like I knew when I turned on the All Star game because I, I wasn't watching games every day like I was like I was as I got older. But when you turn on the All Star game, you see the best players in the game. Like you see Jordans, you see Kobe's, you see the the best players, and even coming off the bench, you see the best players on every team. And I mean, I think now it's 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 so people take it differently now, and so some guys may not take it as serious and. I think when you get to the, the the weekend, some guys are more focused on their team and what they're trying to accomplish in their season. Um, and people don't necessarily look at the All-Star game and All-Star weekend like it used to be and as competitive. And when AI would go at somebody or like when it would be competitive battles, like it, it's not like that no more. And I wish it was. But yeah, me too. I, I know a lot of fans do. But I, I, to be honest, it's, it's more about how like – it's more politics in the game nowadays, and I think that comes with media and how the, the game has changed media-wise, but I think it's more mm -hmm. politics and, and what it comes, and it wasn't people on their phones the whole time video recording the yeah. game. They was literally watching the game if you're there. Like, it's it was more competitive, and you wanted to, to be a part of it, and it's, it's just different nowadays for sure. Yeah. I also think, too, what I know it's not like a basketball thing. I think these are all – kind of side effects of what like being in the moment or not mm -hmm. and now because of what you're saying like with the media with the phones it's hard to be in the moment I think that permeates to all parts of of people and the game too but how did you view the all-star game before you were snubbed and how does snubbing change how you view it oh like like I said like when I was a kid like it was the best players are there like it's even the, the KGs are there like um the best players that you may not even see every night on TV, but they you you hear about them and you know just about them just because of who they are and from being in previous All Stars, like you just you hear about them. Like the best players go to All Star Weekend, and it's like nowadays it's different. And um, I know voting things are different, and all that stuff is it is what it is. And so like I feel like it's just more politics in, into it as and and more other things than it being more about basketball and the best players being there and the top 24 players being there representing the team in the league. 
it's, it's just a lot of other things going on. Yeah. I mean, I've said this before. I remember yelling at the top of my lungs when I was like, Trey should be an all-star. I think that it is a singular award. I don't necessarily think that team success should factor into all star as much as it does because it is literally about being an all star. Mm -hmm. Only you are an all star. But I think that people will always say, "Okay, well, I'm not going to choose this guy because their team isn't doing well. But it's not a team accolade. It is a personal accolade. And even then, like and you, you may think I'm thinking it's just an individual thing, too, because like there's been years that I was a we were top six seed and I was still snub and I was just because maybe I wasn't averaging 30 and 30 and 9, and I was averaging 26 and 9. I mean, I'm not an all-star that year, but our team is better. So, like, what is the criteria? Like, yeah. that that is that is where I just I didn't get it. But, I mean, I don't let it dwell on me, and that's why I feel like the all-star weekend is looked at a little different from certain players. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, speaking of all-star weekend, you were hype about uh, Steph and Sabrina. That mm-hmm. was so much fun. That was my favorite event, too. I know that you have spoken about Caitlin Clark. You're a big Caitlin Clark fan. Oh, yeah. She, of course, is an excellent <laughs> shooter, oh, yeah. and that is an understatement. Of course, she's going to be in the WNBA soon. Would you ever do, like, a Caitlin Trey three-point contest at All-Star? Man, <laughs> of course. Of course I would. I've, I've, gotten to, I've gotten to talk to her, too, throughout her college years. Like, she's been – we're the only two people that ever led college in mm-hmm. points and, and assists. assists. Yep. Like, that's, that's a crazy stat. I mean, I would, I would. I'd have to definitely practice a lot more than I have for these previous three-point <laughs> competitions but uh no nah, I'd be ready for sure yeah you would do that I'd do it what parallels do you see between you two um I mean she can she can really score the ball obviously but I, I love her passing like mm-hmm. there's times that like she's dribbling and she can just pass it with I mean off the right hand left hand bounce passing she she does something that like I feel like I do and it's pass people open like Sometimes like it's a difference in just throwing it to someone when they're open and and making making the right pass, but also throwing them into the the right place and throwing them open and into scoring baskets. So I, she does a lot of that. Yeah, she's so exciting. No, she's like I mean, crazy. it. She has truly like what she has done for the game. Um, her Angel Reese. I mean, so many of the women's college basketball players is really really exciting I think that we're really in this moment where people understand that you should watch women's basketball not because you need to support women's hoops but because it's amazing basketball no for sure and I feel like the the time is right right now for the WNBA to take advantage of all these players about to come into the W and I want all the fans obviously that they follow these these young women in college like to to follow them through the WNBA because I mean, the W has some really good players, too, and they obviously came from these college programs. So you want to follow them as they go, go into the W, too, and that will grow the game even more. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, well, one of the many reasons we are doing this show today is to also talk a bit about From the Point oh, yeah. with Trey Young. You're a podcaster now. Yeah. Uh, what have you enjoyed <laughs> about podcasting? Uh, I mean, I'm not obviously doing it as much as you are, uh, <laughs> not every day or at a, as high of a level yet, but... Uh, I mean, it's just it's something that obviously I wanted to have a platform for me. Like, there's been things that have been said about me and interpretations made about me and things like that that I obviously wanted to have a place that I could go and I could speak out if I ever needed to or wanted to. And now I have that with my my platform and my podcast. So that's something that was really uh, influential to me. And then obviously just something that is cool. I, I chop it up with my homies all the time. We talk sports, talk other things so it's not just about me so it's mm-hmm. it's about all all types of things and, and topics going on so it was, it was something I really wanted to do yeah it's really clear to me too when you touched on it there but you felt the need for there to be something that allowed you to have a voice that mm-hmm. feels like it was very important to you when you were doing this show and I was watching an interview that you did with um, Evan Turner and Andre Iguodala and you all were talking about podcasting and your quote was I'm not necessarily just going to let certain things slide anymore. There's been so much said about me that is not true. What is the most incorrect narrative uh, that is out there about you that you really wanted to address? Um, I mean, I don't know if it's, if everybody has a certain narrative about me or a few people have a certain narrative about me. I think the one, the one thing that just makes me the most mad is just the word selfish like mm. I mean I've gotten into it with I mean 
previous coaches um, just from even just saying it in certain group meetings. And even if they weren't interpreting it with me, I would bring it up to them after and be like, we got to use a different word. Like, just because selfish is just one one thing that doesn't run in any part of my body. And uh, just ever since I was a kid, like, I've always just wanted to do things for others and just uh, impacts winning. Like, I've been a number two on a championship team in high school, playing with the number one player in the country. Like, I've I've been able to sacrifice for the, the better of the group and my whole life in certain in certain places. And uh, so I think selfish is, is the one word. I don't know if everybody has that narrative about me, but just from just from playing in the league and just maybe just hearing it every now and then, like I, I feel like that's one word that I feel like people just misinterpret about me the most. So. Yeah. Why is not being labeled selfish this important to you? And also, why do you think that this selfish narrative exists at all? Uh, I mean, it bugs me the most just because I feel like it affects certain things that can be positive in in my life. When I mean, it could it could impact bringing maybe a, a star player to Atlanta or, or two star players to Atlanta. Um, it could impact certain things being said about me and just a, a missed look unless you really meet me and, and talk to me that you wouldn't really understand. So I think that's what really really bugs me the, the most about it. So. Mm-hmm. So you said that there have been times you have had to talk to people about, you know, using that word. How did those conversations go? Oh, they they go good. They go good. And they, I mean, people start to really learn about me and know about me. Like whenever I had those conversations, it's like I'm really the the happiest guy. Like I really just I'm competitive. Like I'm so I've always been so competitive. I want to win. Like I've always been told winning takes care of everything. Like. I wasn't a top five point guard in my class until I started winning. Like, I wasn't a McDonald's All-American until I won Peace Jam. Mm-hmm. Like, coming out of Oklahoma, you don't, you don't, it's not easy. So, like, I've just always been competitive. And so, like, I think that gets misinterpreted as in certain ways. And I feel like, to your second question, I didn't answer it, but I feel like it could it could be, it could be because coming into the league, I put up a lot of numbers and we don't win as much and things like that. And you could looked at as a certain way and I feel like for me it was just I'm just trying to win I'm trying to do everything I can I try to to show I want to win by playing every night playing as much as I can and being there for my team so I think that can just sometimes get misinterpreted yeah I would also think too being a point guard being Mm. called selfish is like the worst thing you can be called (laughs) oh for sure yeah for sure that's 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 why too is like I'm trying to I'm trying to build something I'm trying to bring people with me I know a lot of people like I know I could help a lot of people win a lot of things like it's just this label and I don't know if they feel this way or not it's just out there and it's like I feel like that's just why that's just one thing if I could make it vanish that's one thing I wish yeah and so no more selfish we're making it vanish (laughs) now (laughs) yeah there we go there we go one of my favorite favorite quotes from you is when you said if you don't think I have been disrespected then you just are not telling the truth what does Trey Young disrespect look like to you I don't know I'll let you do that I'll let you you tell people or whoever out there um want to talk about the disrespect I mean for me like I just like that like little little things like being labeled as selfish for the way I play or uh, little things like that I feel like that's just you just don't know that you just don't know the game you just don't know me so Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll let everybody else talk about that part okay then what does Trey Young respect look like um I mean my peers my peers like that know I respect them. They know. They know how I am when I'm with them, or like they know, like when we on the court, I respect them. They know when we're off the court, like I'm gonna show them love and I'm gonna respect them too. Like I'm never the type. Like I'm every time I meet a a former great or a top 75 player, I always inter- introduce myself or just say what's up, legend. Like I I know it's Shaq. Or I'll say Dominique. Like I don't say say their names. I say what's up, legend. Like. Mm-hmm. Cause I just have that much respect for him and like I have that much like gratitude towards him. So like that's that's really my respect towards 
towards people, towards anybody. Like I always, I always start out giving you respect for sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, I want to talk about, um, as a Hawks fan, a very fun moment for me, of course, was that Eastern Conference Finals run. Mm. I was at every home game oh, yeah. um, of that. It was <laughs> the best time. I was on a happy on another level rooting for you all. Yeah. What do you remember most about the 2021 playoffs as a whole? Man, I remember so many things. It's, <laughs> it's, it's crazy because that was one of like, the best times of my life and like, I just remember the vibes just being great. Like we, it felt like we were defeating the world. Like nobody had us beating the Knicks. Like everybody besides Taylor Rooks had us <laughs> losing to the Knicks in the first round in five or six. Like, and we went out, beat them in five. Like it's, it was a crazy feeling. And then next series, we're playing the number one seed with Ben and Joel, and they're hot. Like they never went to the conference finals. They, this is the year, they have a chance to win it all. Like. We go in there and beat them. We really should have won in six, but we made it interesting in one in seven. And it was just, even when we flew up to Philly, like, we never had a, a doubt that we wouldn't win. And just the vibes were high, and I feel like that was just a great time. And uh, everybody everybody knew their role, and everybody just was excited about playing. And you could just tell, like, even Lou Will, that being his first time going to the conference yeah. finals, I was just happy for, like, guys like him. I would think, too, I mean, just seeing how you light up talking about it, the joy that came from being at the Eastern Conference Finals, knowing what that feeling is, I would think that every year since that, that you have not gotten there, is, like, crushing. Mm -hmm. Is that what it feels like? Oh, it's, it's, it's worse than that. Like, I mean, and then after, like, the year after we go there, it's like we, yeah. we play the Heat, and I don't have – I mean, John missed the last 20 games or 15 games of the regular season and comes back the first game of playoffs. But we don't have Clint because we heard him. He got hurt in the play-in. And, like, we, we battling through so many adversities, and I'm I'm playing bad. And now it feels like the whole world is just shifted and, like, the outlook on you is different. It's like just a year goes by and it's different. And the whole vibe just from two years can be totally opposite. And it was crazy feeling. But, yeah, it was a – it was a terrible time for sure, but yeah, it was something that you really didn't understand what was, what, what it would be like after going on that run. Yeah, I'm happy you said that because that's a thought that I have always had. It's like there's this idea of expectations. People think that you have to reach a certain level. Then you do when you get to a place like the Eastern Conference Finals, but the expectations continue to change. So mm -hmm. they wanted a lot from you before you made it there. Mm -hmm. But then you make it there and you then set a new higher expectation. And any time that you don't, it becomes a he's not good, he can't do it, this mm -hmm. was a fluke, it was one time, et cetera, et cetera. How have you dealt with that like expectation change that seems like it's always moving with you? Like, I want that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want that expectation. Like, I want, I want people to go into the arena and be like, oh, yeah, we, they playing whoever, the, the Milwaukee Bucks. It's going to be a great game. Like, it's going to be the Nuggets, the defending champs. They, we, we still may win. Like, I want those expectations. Like, after you go to the conference finals, are you supposed to win? Are you supposed to get back there even further? So, like, not one of those expectations just shows you a loser. Like, I feel like if you want those, like, it just shows that you know that you're going to win and those expe expectations just come with winning. And that's, that's all you want as a competitor and as a high level athlete, like you want that. And so that's, that's for me, like I'm at that point, like I want that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. What amount of pressure do you feel personally? I don't, I don't feel pressure. Like I know pressure's there, but like, I don't like necessarily feel it or like let it dwell on me. Like obviously I know it's there, but as a leader, you don't, I mean, for me personally, I don't, I don't let it affect me. Mm -hmm. So for people that do say, because they tell me this all the time when mm -hmm. I talk about it, when people say that that Eastern Conference Finals run was a fluke, what's your response to that? It wasn't, I mean, a fluke? Like, um, I'd like to see what a fluke is. Like, what a, I mean, I think we made shit happen. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, you can't just walk in and beat Joel and Ben and Tobias and them. Mm -hmm. four times like this this ain't college basketball this ain't you know, this ain't a one night thing like if you win one game it's, it's over like you had to beat them four times like, we had to beat two really good teams four times and we almost beat three and 
I feel like if we would have went to the finals, as much as anybody want to say, I feel like we could have we could have won that, and it wouldn't have been a fluke. Like we would have won, we would have took that championship and took took everything we earned. So I don't feel like it was a fluke, but that's just me. What does winning feel like to you? Um, winning is the best feeling. Like it's just it's the ultimate feeling. It's everything you work for. You don't put in the the, the long hours, the early mornings for for nothing and to go out there and just not win. So I feel like the, I mean, winning is everything for me. Yeah. What does losing feel like to you? Uh, losing feels like, losing feels awful. Losing feels like shit. Losing feels like you just, you wasted the work that you put in, but um, you know you have to go through some losses to get some wins. So you understand that part. Yeah. You had a quote, another quote that I loved. I love quotes on this show. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You said, I have trusted the plan my whole life, no matter how hard or tough it gets. Why stop now? At what point in your NBA career has trusting the plan been the most difficult? Hmm. Um, I mean, it's it's times like right now, obviously – I mean, it's time after my second year, like when we had the same record after my rookie year and we did the same thing, like had the same record. I feel like probably that time, that was probably the toughest time. Like you just felt you, you, I was my all-star starter that year, like played really well, but I think we had just a little, won two more games and it was like, you just, you feel different. So I think that was probably the time for me. You tend to, or it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, like how every day you'll say another day, another opportunity. Like are those things that you are telling yourself when you are in moments like this that seem like they're much harder? For sure, for sure. Uh, definitely. Like that's that's a, that's a model I live by. Like I don't only post it just for, for other people. Like I post it for myself. Like it's another day, another opportunity. We get to wake up and be better like at something or – Whatever it is, like I can be better at being a big brother, I mean a better father, like whatever. It's just being better at something that day. And so that's not only a reminder to every everybody else, but it's it also is a reminder to me. Yeah. Today what were you focused on being better at? Being better at not moving <laughs> this hand as much. It's starting to starting to throb a little bit, so I'm trying to be better at not moving as much. Oh, will the throbbing come, like, if it hits something? Yeah, when, yeah, yeah. Like, I'll accidentally bump it against a door or something. Like, I've done that twice already, so I... Oh, no! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got to... I'm getting back tomorrow to see her, so... Okay, gotta, yeah, you got to keep it still. I'll be still. Um, my favorite episode of the show that you have done from The Point was actually when you so honestly talked about and just addressed people saying that you are a coach killer. I think with Nate, having vets like Gallo and... I mean, Lou Will, like the guys we had, like it really helped him and it made us a really, really good team. And we were able to go to the conference finals and it just, it just made us really good that year. And that, that was, it just fit that, that, that team fit Nate. Yep. And I think that just is what, what that year revolved around it. People want to label me as a coach killer about that whole situation, but really that's all it is. It's just certain coaches fit certain teams and that's what it was. It don't make the coach bad or good. Because I think it was one of the one of the first times that I really saw you just be very open publicly about something. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that you had a really <laughs> great response to it. Obviously, I want to win, and I don't I don't know this process. And you got to lose, and you getting picks, and you doing this next year, waiting two years to be good. Like so, like there's times that I would be so competitive and so ready to win, like that maybe we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of a lot of things and I don't blame that necessarily on him or or me I feel like um maybe if it was more communicated and I don't necessarily feel like they needed to, to communicate to me like the process or what it what it would be like but I feel like just me in my competitive terms like trusting a two-year three-year process is like it's hard for me to understand right out the gate or just come into the league and just already know like I'm coming in I'm thinking we're gonna make the playoffs we're gonna win I'm a play hard I, I just led the country in points and assists in college like I had gotten us to a top five I mean ranking at one point like I feel like we can turn things around quick and win so 
I feel like Lloyd, it would be just like we had times like we were really good, but um, I just sometimes we just didn't see eye to eye, and it was just a situation. But Nate, it was like the first time I ever had a coach that just let me really rock and like put our team. We had a, a, a different type of group. We had Bogdanovich, we had Clint now, we had Gallinari, and so it's a different type of team than what Lloyd had. And Nate just came in, it was the first time ever we found the mismatch. We, find the mismatch and just made the game easier for me and mm -hmm. it was just made it easier and so I feel like we had a lot of moments where it was good and then we obviously went on the run and and then obviously when things change and people's expectations change like you said it, it's a lot of the the fault and blame falls back on the coach and we both knew that and I feel like that we had a really good relationship um and it was just the, the fallout from the the last couple series mm -hmm. made it the way it was but yeah we uh we had really good relationships and um, it was just certain times that certain things bumped heads, and but that's that's common. That's like mm -hmm. it's, especially winning teams. Like winning teams have it more than the losing team. Yeah, and and that's what I feel like the common fan doesn't really necessarily understand or know. But I feel like we had really good relationships. Yeah, like I feel like to your point, a lot of people don't understand that like the the conflict or the disagreements is actually a necessary part of getting better. Mm -hmm. And to your point, winning that's the only way that you come out of the other side of these things with things that you can take with you For is sure. through having those conversations. So I, I completely understand that point. I think that with how the media can be sometimes, not to not include myself. <laughs> I know I am also a part of the media. Um, but the media sometimes can paint things, like ta talking about you being a coach killer and things like that, which can cause dissent amongst maybe you and the coach or you and a team. When those sort of stories would come out, did you ever get the chance or opportunity to talk to your coaches or your former coaches about it? Um, uh, what part? What do you mean? Like when Nate was let go and then people a lot of the time are putting it on you. Did yeah. you get to have a conversation? No. And no, and I never did. Like, I, I mean, it's sad, but like, I, I still haven't talked to Nate about it. Like, I mean, I don't know how he felt about it. I don't know what, like, and that's another thing. Like, you just never know how other people feel. And, mm -hmm. and it's tough being in his situation. Like, being let go and certain certain things not necessarily being his fault like I get it but like that, that's why it's, it's tough because there's also a lot of people in Atlanta media not a lot of people just a certain people um and they're not even here no more like who would start start stories and make things up like or even if they weren't making things up it was that that would be what feed things that would be what mm -hmm. feed feed the land of people and feed them and make a lot of people talk and that's what would start those those rumors and narratives about me and Nate or me and Lloyd like it would just make things bigger um than what they really were mm -hmm. and when those are the only stories really coming out of Atlanta throughout the year like mm -hmm. you just paint this picture of me and like and who knows what how they feel about me or how what they what they felt about the certain situations but um I mean, Quinn was at my wedding, like, yeah. obviously, like, we we send invitations, but it's like, it's just, it's the business, it's like, it's part of it, and uh, there's no hate, there's no hatred towards them, they, they should know that, I mean, from being around me, they just know how competitive I am and winning, and they know it's never hate, so. Yeah, no, and it, it certainly is a business, and when you're growing up, and just watching the NBA, you don't really think about the business part of it. Mm -mm. But then you get in the league and you could argue it's a little, it's probably more business than it is play. No, for sure. For yeah. sure. I mean, there's a lot of things that like, I used to want to want to be a coach after I was done, oh, but <laughs> come on now. Like that's, I'm nah, I'm yeah. being in this business, just being like, it's just, I definitely don't want to be a, a coach at the NBA level. Like it's just too much. I mean, stress and um, too much on them, um, and, and they don't have necessarily as much control as a lot of people think. So, um, but they do as far as who they have on the on the court and who they coaching. But um, but it would be tough to be a coach if I was, I couldn't do it. <laughs> okay, so I know you've decided you don't want to coach, but just in this fantasy land, <laughs> indulge me. Yeah. What kind of coach would you be? What would your style be? Man, I, I would be like a laid back coach. I would I would obviously put my imprint on where I needed to. I would let my let my players play. I mean, I I'd, I'd go get the players that I felt like I needed to win a championship and I let them play and I I coach them where they needed to be coached, but 
you got you got to let your players be confident. Like the best the best players, they just the reason they're the best is because they're confident. And mm-hmm. so when you let them play confidently, I mean, it's going to let them play the best. Okay, so, and you can't say Quinn because I know that's your answer. Of course, he is your favorite coach in the league, as he should be. Uh-huh. But if you can't say Quinn, who's another coach in the NBA that you look at and think this is, like, this is a coach? This is a great coach. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot. Uh, I mean, but I've known T. Lou for a long time. Like, Great pick, yeah. <laughs> like, if I was to, to simulate my style of coaching, like, it's the way T. Lou is. That's probably how I'd coach. Just laid back, let everybody, let everybody hoop, but call timeouts whenever they're on the run or something. Like, <laughs> I, I'd be like that. I love that. And, I mean, they are. They're cooking right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm loving watching them. Uh, growing up, you would get to meet a lot of NBA players, take photos with a lot of different <laughs> NBA players. What encounter sticks out to you the most now? Um, From back then? Yeah, from back then. Uh. I still talk about it um, every now and then. It, it's funny because, like, I didn't know, like, some, like, Christian, like, L- red bottoms wear, like, Louboutins oh, wear. Oh, Louboutins, yeah. Yeah, Louboutins. And I seen Russ walk out the arena one time. I was outside at the game. He had the spikes on. And I was like, what are those? And he was like, you'll, you'll realize what they are one day. And now, <laughs> looking back at it, I know yeah. what they are now. But... It's crazy. Like, those are some expensive shoes he had on that <laughs> night that I said that to him. Yeah, yeah, but now I could get those. I could get a few, <laughs> yeah, a few a if I wanted. <laughs> okay, so I've obviously seen a bunch of photos. So I know you met Russ, of course. I know Dame. I saw the photo of you and KD. Yeah. What am I missing? Who's someone you met you didn't get a photo of? A lot. That it um, meant a lot to you? Man. So, like, I was, I was in OKC going to games when they were even the OKC Hornets. So, like, when CP was there, so, like, even guys like Speedy Claxton, like, were really cool to me. Like, a lot of people now probably wouldn't even know who that is. But I had a jersey of his. Um, somebody who I didn't get a picture with. I don't know. Like, I got a picture with a lot of my. Yeah, but my you were that player. age. Everyone always had a phone. Everyone yeah, always that, had Yeah, that was the time. You had little flip phones, too. So that was, yeah, that's right when it started, too. No, I love it. One of my favorite things in the NBA is just seeing like the little kid NBA players yeah. with the big, with the big ones, with no. all the legends. I love it. Um, you, of course, as you know, are the focal point of a lot of rumors at the moment. So before I ask any of these questions, I want to put a disclaimer and be very clear that the Hawks have not said anything, and Trey has not requested a trade. These are just r- reports. So when you wake up and you go on your phone and you see all these rumors, right? <laughs> How do you feel? Or what's your first call? Like, what? Take me into that moment. What does that feel like for you? Some of the best players ever have been traded. Like, so who am I to just be here mad or feeling unwanted or feeling a certain way? Like, if, like if you don't want me, then okay. Then I feel like somebody else, somebody else will. So um, that's okay. I, but for me, like I said, I'm not in that place. Uh, I'm where my feet are right now, and I'm recovering and rehabbing and. We're about to start rehabbing, so I'll be all right. Okay. So then I'll just ask plainly, do you believe that you will be in Atlanta next season? Hopefully. Like, I mean, when I was drafted here, I, I envisioned, like, I could have went to Kentucky. I could have went to Kansas, but I chose to be different and went to Oklahoma to try to win a championship. Like, I, I wanted to go there with my hometown, be different. They've never won a championship in Atlanta. Like, doing that, like, me getting drafted there was felt like a – Felt like it was match made in heaven. Like, this is something I want to do. Like, I'm a, I can, I can defeat the odds here too. So, for me, my my whole envision was to always be here. Like, my whole goal was to win here, win championships, bring people here with me, and build this this championship here and dynasty here. Um, but who knows? Like, it's year six now, and who knows? Like, for me, like I I want that. Okay, so just so I can repeat what I'm saying to be clear, for you, these rumors are like, it's it's not me. You're like, I want to be in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you've heard it from the source. Like, I, <laughs> I want to win, but that, that's what you've heard too. Like, I just want to win. So if that's that's in Atlanta, that's that's where I want to be. That's where I envision myself being, but that's that's it. That's it. Yeah. Well, you know, just as we talk about the business of sports, I do want to know, because um, you are – repped by one of the goats in Rich Paul. Mm-hmm. What separates being repped by a guy like that <laughs> versus any other person? Um, I think I think a lot of people 
I think we have a lot of similarities. I think some people fear him uh, <laughs> the way they fear me. Um, I think in us going different routes and different ways that like we can relate. And I feel like, I mean, he's, he's definitely one of the, the best agents, obviously, ever. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a difference being, being handled by someone like him, for sure. What was, like, the selling point to you about Rich? Because I always hear guys tell me their stories about how Rich was able to get them. See, me and Rich's story is different. So, like, he he, he came and got my guy Omar. Like, my man Omar Wilkes was my agent um, from the jump. And, like, I had I had known Rich for a long time. He had known my, my dad uh, longer. But really, out of, the, out of college, it was more Omar for me. Like, I was Omar and then... Uh, Rich signed him, and then um, that's how I got over to Clutch, and then it was it was match made in heaven. Then, but Rich knew he had to sign Omar to, to bring me over, cause, <laughs> and and Omar loved it. Like Omar loved loved Omar loved uh, Clutch loved Rich. Now he's with Fanatics, but he's uh, Rich is the best for sure. I love that. Also, shout out to Omar. I work with him a lot over at Fanatics. He is absolutely the best. But yeah, I'm like, does Rich Paul ever take no for an answer? I, I feel like no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, he's that has never uh, crossed his mind. Uh, a few more for you. I just want to say, I have never been to a Hawks game where I did not see your dad. And mm. I love that, that yeah. he is at every single one. It is so clear that you all have a very special, close relationship. With you being a dad now, what is something that your dad has always made you feel that you also want your children to always feel? Oh, I mean, that I can come to him with anything, like, with anything, like, from the best to the worst. So I just want my my kids to always know that, like, I'm here for them with whatever. I'm always going to have their back, no matter if we had just got into an argument 30 minutes before. If they break their leg, they better be yelling for dad, like, because I'm always be there for them. Like, I'm a... That's that's one thing that my dad has just always just been there for me. So if I could be that for my my kids, that's that'll be enough for me. When you're playing in State Farm and like you look over and see him, does that do something to you on the court? For sure, for sure. Um, he's not as like into it as he used to. Like I had to really. <laughs> he's first off, he's walking around. He's like the mayor of that place. <laughs> I see him, but not in his seat. <laughs> no, yeah, that's what I'm saying. He's more chill than what he used to be. Like I had to, I had to 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 get on him, like. My second year, we were losing and things. He's still making facial expressions, doing certain things, and I had to, I had to get on him and and tell him that like, he can relax. Like I'm, I'm here. I can do it now. I'm older now. Like I can handle myself. So he's a lot more chill. Like you see him now. Like you said, walking around the arena is different, but. He used to be a lot more into it, for sure. <laughs> Tell me, of course, in Atlanta, there's a lot of celebs that come out for the games. Tell me your favorite, like, courtside celeb story that we have never heard. Ooh. Courtside celeb story. Man, I mean, there's a lot of celebrities that go through. I don't know if, if there's one that... And I'll tell you why I'm asking this. Yeah. Because, like, if I'll go to the game with Quavo... <laughs> He is talking to y'all, like, trying to tell you plays. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, they're not listening to you. See, that's the thing about Quay. Quay needs to, like, chill because you can really, like, when you courtside, sometimes <laughs> you can really hear what some of the fans are saying courtside, even across. Like, yeah. Like, Quay be yelling, like, yo, coach, put blah, blah, blah in. Like, <laughs> take him out. Like, he just sometimes, and, and really, it turns out the opposing team, like, Coming into as a as a road fan, like even in a certain arenas, like whenever a, a road celebrity or somebody on the court starts talking, it usually turns us up or turns me up. Like, and we obviously have it every game, and so Quay is always turning somebody on the other team up or Boosie or somebody. Yeah. Is somebody like that's why I respect Change. Change be over there chilling until it's the fourth quarter, and him and Halo stand up, and then. They'll start cheering and, and going. But. Yeah, they're chilling. The, the other rappers, they are not. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> he was talking so much. We went to, like, I think it was Hawks Heat, and he was talking so much shit to the Heat players. I'm like, they, you, why they want. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> you got to blame them sometimes for some of the L's you take. I love it. All right, so before we go, uh, we ask everybody this question. Who has given you the biggest assist off the court? Um, The biggest assist off the court? Um, I don't know. I, 
I have a lot of people. My my family, my my wife, my my mom, my dad. I can't just name one person. I gotta name my whole family, my homies, everybody, my little brother, so yeah. my sisters, like everybody everybody holds me down so yeah you're like it's been a whole village to everybody get everybody gives me an assist right here. i yeah. love it well trey you already know you my guy i appreciate uh, you coming and doing this you are fantastic good luck on the pod i love listening and good luck recovering i'm looking forward to seeing you out there again appreciate it thank you thank you of course